Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. Hello, good morning, and good afternoon to our colleagues in Europe, and good evening to the colleagues in Asia. So uh, welcome you again to this World River Delta Source to Think webinar series. And today um, we invite the uh, Yota Yutas uh, Baranas from University of uh, uh, Cambridge. Uh, he goes name Yutas. So uh, talk about how to measure the suspended sediment and the carbon transport in the large river system, particularly uh, folks on their research and the field work uh, on the Irrawaddy and the Sovereign River. So uh, also this coming Friday, we have a talk uh, given by Sam Bentley from uh, Louisiana State University. He will talk about the story Mississippi River, the source to sink system, tectonic climate and human influence all the way from Miocene to Anthropocene. So uh, uh, Yurtis uh, got his uh, bachelor degree in chemistry in 2011 at Jacob, Jacobs University Bremen in Germany and uh, then got his PhD of science at the University of South, Southern California, USC in 2017. Uh, now currently he is a postdoc in the University of Cambridge working with uh, Edward, Mike and other people in the carbon, body chemical and the sediment, particularly folks on the Irrawaddy and the Solomon River. So I think uh, your test now is your turn. Please share your screen and put the presentation mode. Yep. All right, let me just share. All right, hopefully you can see that. Uh, very good. All right, yeah, thanks Paul so much uh, for uh, inviting me. Uh, and thanks for organizing this series. Um, it's been really a lot of enjoyable talks. Um, so I'll be talking about the work um, that I've been doing for the past three years or so in Cambridge, working on, on these river basins in Southeast Asia. Uh, and this is obviously, you know, a collaborative effort of, of a lot of people, um, both in Cambridge and, and across the UK and other institutions. Um, so I'll start off by uh, showing this figure. Um, which might be seared into a lot of people's brains at this point, if you've, if you've been attending a lot of these talks. Um, a number of authors have shown it because it's really the sort of state-of-the-art compilation of um, global river influxes uh, into, into the ocean of, of water and this particular figure of sediment. Um, uh, it's from Milman and Farzman, 2011. Um, and by the way, I'll be all the references um, I'll give at the end. So if you want to look up a specific paper, you don't have to be frantically searching right now. There will be a slide at the end where you can, if it's recorded, you can pause and, and just find the papers um, that you're interested in. Um, so Milman Farnsworth estimated um, by compiling global river data that there should be about 19 gigatons of, of uh, sediments discharged into the ocean. Um, but of course, this number is highly uncertain, and they don't didn't really provide an estimate in, in, in this book, the compilation that they had, but it's probably somewhere on the order of, of five gigatons and maybe, maybe more. Um, and uh, of this total flux, large rivers obviously unsurprisingly dominate, you know, a, a large portion of this flux. Um, and part of the reason for, for this high uncertainty is that it's difficult to measure sediment discharge in, in large rivers. And that's sort of what I'll talk about today a bit. And what, another thing that you'll notice is that really two thirds of, of this flux is um, estimated to be coming out, uh, out of Southeast Asia. Uh, so about 13 gigatons per year. And, and this is a reason why there's been quite a lot of focus on this region recently and the river basins in this region. And that's what we've done in Cambridge as well. Uh, particularly working on the Irrawaddy Salween and the Mekong. Um, and um, I'll be focusing on the Irrawaddy and Salween for today. Um, so just to orient you, um, hopefully you can see Google Earth now. Um, these are the Irrawaddy and the Salween basins outlined here. The Irrawaddy in pink uh, and the Salween in uh, purple. Um, 
And uh, you know, they both drain, the headwaters drain the Eastern Himalayan syntaxis. Uh, the Salween extends into the Tibetan Plateau. Uh, in the West, the Irrawaddy drains the, in the Burman Range. And then there's, the, um, they both drain the Shan Plateau in the uh, Eastern bit. Um, and so we've, um, I'll be talking about data that we collected um, close to the mouth of both rivers. So for Irrawaddy, it was at PA, which is essentially the lowest point. You can really sample it before it, it splits into distributors in the Delta and for Selween in, in Hapa'an, uh, which is quite close to its mouth here. Um, it doesn't really have a big Delta. So um, first I wanted to mention that there's been quite a lot of work done on um, the source to sink dynamics of these basins, particularly in, in uh, the past couple of years, has sort of become a bit of a hotspot, actually. Um, and a lot of work has been done by authors that actually have given some of the uh, talks in the, the source to sink series or, or about to give some in the coming weeks. So if you're interested in this region, you should definitely check check those out. Um, and there's, there's also a number of published papers and ongoing studies um, particularly at the sink side of things. Um, on the delta and how it's evolved, there's some sediment records in the delta itself, um, some sediment records off um, offshore in the Andaman Sea, sort of further deep, deep fan sediments. Um, and then a bunch of recent work, which Paul himself has also been involved in, in the shelf sediments and how they're distributed. Um, but not as much has been done really at the source side of things. So really what's coming down the river basins. Um, there's been a, a great paper by Garzanti et al in 2016, looking at the sediment um, or the, the bank river bank sand composition, um, its chemistry and provenance and dating some zircons. And then in terms of sediment flux um, in the Irrawaddy, really interestingly, the most data uh, comes from um, the 19th century, um, from the study by Gordon. Um, uh, and it's more recently been revisited by Robinson et al. in 2007, Bird et al. in 2008. Um, and then there's another paper in 2009 um, for each et al., giving some of the early sediment and organic carbon flux estimates. Um, and there's really no, pretty much no data on the Salween itself, or there hasn't been up until recently. Um, and for the Irrawaddy, again, a lot of this data is really based on 19th century samples. Um, so what we've done, um, uh, this work that I'll be talking about um, today has been recently published in, in JGR Earth Surface. Um, so you, if you prefer, you know, reading instead of listening, um, then you might just go and read the paper. Um, and we've, uh, measured, um, we took a bunch of samples and made a bunch of measurements to estimate the sediment fluxes, um, this water discharge sediment and organic carbon fluxes, both in the Rwadi and the Salween at these sites. So the challenge with large rivers is that, um, you know, they're not easy to sample. Um, so this is just to give you some sense of, of the scale, uh, those of you who perhaps haven't been on one of these rivers and haven't worked on them. This is a footage from uh, the Irrawaddy, um, you know, this is in the river channel, um, somewhere in the lower basin. And you can see how, how massive it is. And these are very wide, big, and quite deep channels. Um, and so it is tricky to um, get some sort of representative um, sample and, you know, to constrain the fluxes um, on the scale. And another particular challenge is that um, River sediments are often a complex mixture of, of different types of um, minerals, of different grain sizes, you know, sand, clay, silt. Um, and frequently these get sorted in, in such a way in the river channel that um, most sand gets carried at the bottom. And so, you know, to really capture the whole flux, you really have to um, capture that sand flux close to the river bottom. And so what people have um, then typically is, is to collect depth samples and also to combine that with um, some surrogate techniques such as acoustic sensing of, of um, into the river channel of water flow and, and sediment. Um, so that's what we've done as well. Um, so this is our this was our research vessel um, for a number of the field campaigns uh, in Myanmar. 
um, we essentially established a lab on it. And um, one of the years we went down the whole length of the Rawadi River pretty much um, living um, and working on, on the ship. Um, and to measure the river flow, we use what's called an ADCP or acoustic uh, Doppler current profiler, uh, which you can see rigged up here on the boat. Um, and you know, you just lower this into the water. And the way it works um, is that it sends an acoustic signal into the river channel um, uh, and it bounces back off of the sediment that is being transported in the river channel. Um, and it gives you a, a measurement of how quickly the, the water is flowing in different depths. And of course, it gives you the, the channel morphology or um, uh, where the bottom is. And so if you, if you um, cross the river channel from left to right several times, you can get uh, a very accurate measurement of um, water discharge this way. Um, there's also some potential that um, theoretically these instruments could yield sediment concentrations as well because they're really bouncing off off the sediment um, but it's not easy to do there's been some recent studies where people have sort of started looking at that more seriously um, but there's there's a number of problems because they are only typically sensitive to particular grain sizes that, that may not be dominant in in the river that you're working on and stuff like that and there's um, it's not so easy to do but there's some recent progress on this um, but what we've done um, instead was to collect depth samples um, using this sampler here. Um, so it's essentially a Van Dorn open tube design. Um, and what uh, you do is essentially just lower into the water column into the depth that you're interested in. You drift with the river flow um, to make sure that the water is uh, flowing through the sampler freely. Um, to, to get what's called isokinetic conditions uh, so that you're not really fractionating what's going through the tube. Um, and then you snap it shut um, at the depth and the place that, that, that you want to sample. And this particular sampler is, is custom built in Cambridge and it's the you know, larger volume than, than usual. It's uh, almost nine liters, which essentially helps um, you know, reduce some of the uncertainties because the more, the larger the volume you sample, the, the lower the uncertainty. Um, in the suspended concentration measurements that you get out of that. And then we, of course, have to filter all that water. So um, particularly, we don't um, let it settle and we don't decant our samples. So we filter everything to make sure that we get all the particles, all the fine ones and the coarse ones, um, which takes um, some extra work. So what we do is we use these also custom built uh, filtration units um, uh, that are pressurized and you put the sample you can see here into, into this pressurized cylinder. Um, um, the water comes out the bottom and you capture all the sediment on, on a filter here. Um, and it takes a lot of, a lot of pumping to do this, uh, especially if the samples are clay rich that, you know, that they get clogged pretty quickly and, and you have uh, keep them pressurized. So this is how it looks on the boat, actually, that our sort of field lab. Um, and you can see the sediment being filtered. So we've done this um, uh, multiple times in multiple field seasons in both rivers. Um, this is um, a map of where um, we've done the different cross sections and where the different samples have been collected. So the, the circles are the sediment samples. Um, and the lines are the discharge cross sections um, on the Salween and the Irwadi and repeated in, in both high discharge and low discharge conditions um, and collecting samples across the river channel. So before I show our data, I wanted to, to first acknowledge a couple of, um, in my view, seminal papers that, that have uh, used this approach of depth sampling coupled with ADCP. Um, and one of them is Bushes et al. 2011, where they've done this pretty much the, the first time that um, this type of approach was used in a large river um, for the Amazon basin, um, where they collected ADCP data. So here you can see the um, uh, cross section of the river channel um, depth on the y axis and across the channel on the x axis. 
um, and the water flow velocity. Um, uh, so the warmer colors are, is the higher flow velocity. Um, and they collected, again, sediment samples in different depths in different parts of the river. Um, and then when you measure the sediment concentration in those samples, you can relate that to depth. Um, and what they saw in Amazon is that it, sediment concentrations increase towards the bottom as you would expect. And you can um, use this relationship to convert your um, flow velocity into uh, suspended sediment concentration, or rather convert your uh, depth um, into suspended uh, sediment concentration relations uh, with depth. Um, and in this particular paper, what they've um, done a simplification um, that they did was to average horizontally. So in this map of suspended sediment concentrations here, you can see there the suspended sediment concentration at a particular relative depth is always the same across the whole river channel. And this worked fine for the Amazon because it's a relatively, you know, it's a deep, um, pretty um, symmetrical uh, channel morphology. So the way this um, is done is what's um, using what's called a Rouse model. Uh, so some of you might be familiar with this, um, which is um, a pretty simple relationship relating the suspended sediment concentration, uh, denoted as C here, um, of a particular grain size I uh, to the depth, uh, which is normalized to the total river depth um, and some reference depth that, that could be surface, for example. Uh, so that's this parameter ZR. Um, and um, C I naught is um, uh, the sediment concentration at this reference uh, uh, depth, Z naught. And, and it's a simple uh, parallel relationship with the exponent Ri, which is called a Rouse number, um, which essentially um, is the ratio of um, the settling velocity of your particles, which depends on the grain size. And this is why it's, you know, it, it, it works out for a particular grain size only. Um, and the shear velocity or shear stress in the river, um, which depends on just the, you can calculate that quite easily from, for example, flow velocity, um, average, depth average flow velocity in the river. So essentially the gravitational force um, uh, versus the suspension upward force, uh, turbulent um, force that's suspending the sediment. Um, and so, um, this equation should theoretically um, allow you to predict how sediment concentration would vary with depth. Um, if you just take one measurement of sediment concentration at your reference depth, and if you know your settling velocity, shear velocity, some of these other constants, you should be able to just predict how sediment concentration varies with depth. Um, but um, that's not been the case because um, physics that have to do with sand um, are well known to be the most difficult branch of physics. Um, not that I would know really because I'm a geochemist and I um, have sort of um, uh, don't get into the physics of it. But um, from what I know is that it's very hard to measure uh, the settling velocity, particularly for um, in natural rivers, because it's a complex mixture of uh, different sediments, as I mentioned, that might have different shapes, densities, and, and, and sizes. And then there are some other complications with these, these other parameters, like beta, for example. I'm not going to get into it, but there seems to be um, sort of some debate on how it might vary depending on your flow conditions in your particular system. Um, so what geochemists like me uh, have done, um, as I mentioned, um, and Bouches et al., for example, did in 2011, is to empirically fit um, your data, so your sediment concentrations you collect at various depths, not, not at just one reference depth. Um, and then you can fit that against uh, depth and um, both um, this reference concentration and the Rouse exponent are then easily calculated from those fits. Um, so this is an example from Lipker et al, 2011, um, where they've done this. So on the x-axis here, you can see um, the depth normal normalized depth on the log scale and on the y-axis is the on the log scale um, sediment concentration for different grain sizes and the slope um, is the Rouse exponent here. So you can see for uh, coarser particles like sand 
the sediment concentration increases a lot with depth. Um, and for finer particles like clay here, there's really not much change in, in sediment concentration. And so you can use this relationship to, um, to calculate your, how sediment concentration varies, obviously, with depth um, and get the total flux. Um, and so another paper um, that came out at a very similar time to the Boucher's paper was the Lipker et al. 2011, where they did a similar, um, they uh, did a similar approach um, applying it to the Ganges Brahmaputra basin. And again, you have your ADCP data. Um, from this, you can calculate your uh, shear velocity across the river channel. And you can see where um, you know, the flow velocity is the highest, the shear velocity is the highest. Um, and what they did is they collected a lot of depth profiles um, at different discharge stages and at this, in this particular river reach. Um, and they've, um, whereas the bushes at all we're integrating horizontally um, or averaging their sediment flux horizontally. Um, Lubker et al. averaged it vertically. So um, doing this, they were able to find a pretty simple relationship of the vertically averaged integrated um, sediment flux against the shear velocity. Uh, and they found this nice power law. And from this, it's quite easy to convert from your shear velocity to the vertically integrated sediment flux, and then you just need to sum this up essentially to get the total sediment discharge. And so, with this sort of framework, um, you know, having read these papers, um, we've set out in, in Myanmar to collect our data um, with the intention of applying a, a very similar uh, approach. But we found out quite quickly when, when we started uh, seeing the data that it was probably not going to work exactly the same way. And the reason is that um, the Irrawaddy and Selween channels, their morphology is a bit more complex than, than the Amazon and the Ganges. So this is an example from Selween in the wet season. And you can see this is, again, an ADCP plot of flow velocity across the channel. Um, and the, the purple squares are uh, the depth samples that we collected. Um, and you can see the flow velocity varies quite a lot uh, across the channel. There's some submerged sandbar probably, and it's not, um, you know, most of the flow is, or the flow velocity is highest right next to the left bank. This is not really a meander. This is, you know, the best sort of straight bit of the river that we could logistically get to. Um, and when you're on the river as well, you can see that the flow is sort of very turbulent. And um, because of all this, when you sample the sediment, um, and you measure the concentrations, they're sort of much more scattered. So they don't increase very nicely with depth, uh, like um, in Amazon, for example. Um, you know, you get samples somewhere in the middle um, of the water column, sometimes that have much higher concentration. The concentration on this side of the channel is significantly higher than, than on, on the other side. Um, and this, if you look at the uh, brain size distributions, here, um, you can see that you know, a lot of that has to do obviously with the sand and where it's being transported and suspended. Um, and so there, again, there's not a very nice increase in, in grain size, in the coarser grain size towards the bottom always. Um, and there's a lot of variation laterally and, and um, uh, with depth. Um, and so what we realized is that um, we need to model to, to really represent this, this variation and to get accurate estimates of sediment flux, we need to model the sediment concentration across the whole channel without really averaging horizontally or vertically like Boucher's or Lepker did. Um, and so essentially we need a map uh, of sediment concentrations uh, across the whole channel, kind of like this flow velocity map. Um, and so going back to the Rouse equation, again, this is how Boucher's and Lucker did uh, by fitting their data and just getting these two fitted parameters. Um, what we did was something slightly different, but still very simple. Um, essentially just factoring out the shear velocity parameter in the um, denominator of, of the uh, Rouse exponent. Um, so um, instead of having the whole ROS parameter as a fitted parameter, we only, uh, you know, empirically fit these, a combination of these other parameters 
uh, whereas shear velocity, we can um, add into the model as another explanatory variable, um, which we get from ADCP data. Um, and we can get the shear velocity for, for each sediment sample um, because we, as I mentioned, we when we collect each sediment sample, we drift downstream with the river. Um, but while we do that, we have the ADCP running. Um, and so as we're drifting, we're collecting flow velocity data with depth, um, you know, at each, each second or so. Um, and we collect a bunch of these uh, flow velocity profiles. Uh, and then here on the on this figure in the left, um, it essentially on the x-axis is the drift distance. So we're drifting from left to right. Um, and um, this represents a distance of about 200 meters or so. It takes about two minutes in this case to, to drift. This is for a particular sample. Um, and so we're drifting, we're collecting this flow velocity data. We can calculate average flow velocity, um, you know, averaged with uh, depth. Um, and you can see it goes up and down. Um, we also get the vertical velocity from, from the DCP data, which is this green curve, and it shows often these really nice um, several frequencies, uh, which probably has to do with uh, turbulent cells turning over as, as we're drifting. Um, and from the, from the velocity, you can easily calculate shear velocity. Um, and uh, we collect the sample, the sediment sample, in this case, it was close to the surface here, right? And so we have our sample and we have the hydrodynamic conditions relevant for that sample. So we have the shear velocity um, that's representative of that sediment sample. And then it only becomes a question of sort of what time scale is relevant for, for this particular sample and um, you know, how much of this drift data to, to average. Um, so in, in most cases, it doesn't really um, seem to make much difference. Um, so the dashed line here is the time integrated um, average shear velocity. And you can see it doesn't really vary much. And that, that was the case for most of our samples. So what I ended up doing was integrating and averaging over the precede, 10 seconds preceding our sample collection, but you could also choose a different time scale and it wouldn't make um, a lot of difference. So when you have this data, um, then you can fit um, fit a model to it. Actually, I'm gonna pull up one that's that I can rotate myself. Um, so hopefully you can see that. Um, so the circles here are our data or samples um, and the hatched surface is the, the model fit to the data. Um, on the y-axis is the depth, the Rouse normalized depth. So the bottom um, channel bottom is uh, the bottom and surface is at the top. Um, and then this is a particular plot for a particular grain size, um, um, fine sand in this case. Um, sediment concentration on the log scale here on the this horizontal axis, and then shear velocity on this other horizontal axis. And um, you can see that the samples, the, the darker ones that have higher shear velocity, those are from the wet season, and the, the more pinkish ones are from the dry season when the flow velocity and shear velocity is much lower. And what you can see also is that sediment concentrations are obviously much higher in the wet season. Um, and they also vary with depth. Um, of course, there's a lot of scatter, um, but when you fit the model to it, it shows that you can see from this um, essentially intersection of, of the model fit here that the concentrations are predicted to increase with depth um, as we would expect from the ROS model. Um, so we can then use this model fit to convert our flow velocity data to sediment uh, concentrations uh, of different grain sizes. Um, so showing, again, showing this example from the Salween, we have the flow velocity map from ADCP. Using this model, we can convert it into the suspended sediment concentration map across the whole um, river channel. And we can represent the lateral variation. So we're not doing averaging horizontally or vertically. Um, you know, you can see here that the suspended sediment concentrations are higher, where the flow is higher as you would expect. And you know, there's a, a zone here where there's much less sediment being transported. And the circles here are 
the measured values on the same same color scale as um, as the map itself. Um, and you know the model, of course, does, cannot do a perfect job for every sample, and there's some outliers where it doesn't really match. But overall, it does a really quite decent job of, of representing um, the samples. And because we do this for a number of different grain sizes, we can um, or grain size bins, we can then calculate the or predict the um, grain size distribution and um, parameters like median grain size. So here is the D50 um, map. And as you would expect, you see the grain size, the median grain size increases towards the bottom where you have more sand being carried, um, as you would expect. Uh, and then of course, we can combine this, the velocity and the concentration to calculate the a map of the sediment flux across the channel. And you can sum this whole thing up to get the total flux uh, down the river range. Um, another thing we can do um, is we can calculate the particular organic carbon or POC flux. And we can do this by using um, these nice relationships between um, the grain size, in this case, median grain size, and the organic carbon concentration, um, which show quite nice linear relationships in both of these rivers. And that's been observed for a number of other rivers as well. Uh, where most of the organic carbon is in the finer fraction um, and the sand fraction has you know, much less organic carbon. So we can use this relationship to convert from, from the median grain size to organic carbon concentration in the river um, across the whole channel. Um, and again, also calculating the total POC flux. And this is an example from the dry season where you can see that um, using the same color scheme um, for all the parameters, the flow velocity is much lower. And of course, the, the SSC um, suspended sediment concentrations are lower, grain size is lower, and there's much less variation with depth. Um, organic carbon concentrations are higher because it's mostly fine particles being transported. And you know, we can calculate the fluxes and, and they're generally much lower season. Um, and then we can check how well the model is doing. And so the simplest way to do that is to compare our measured values with the values that are given by the model for the exact same place in the cross section. Um, and so the dashed line is a one to one line and you know the model was doing a perfect job. Everything should fall on this line. Of course, they're scattered around it, um, but you can calculate different um, sort of statistical um, uh, parameters on this and, and to get a sense of how well the model is doing and overall is doing quite a, a good job. Um, and so if you're sort of interested in deals and, and the particular um, numbers here, you can always look it up in the paper. I won't spend too much time on that here. Um, and then the next question that we need to ask is obviously, is this really necessary? Um, or because we've collected all these samples, could we just take the simple average of all the samples that we've collected, multiply that by discharge, and would that give us a very similar value? And so is this model really necessary? And the question, the answer is um, yes, it is in most cases. Um, this is, I just cut out a, a table out of the paper um, just to highlight quickly that, you know, in some cases you can have an error of up a factor of two or so for the sediment flux, if you just take a simple mean of, of the sampled sediments, as opposed to doing the proper Rouse modeling. Um, and for organic carbon can also um, yield similar errors. Um, and comparing that to some of the previous estimates um, <clears throat> for these rivers, we've calculated for organic carbon, especially a much lower flux um, that has been um, calculated in the past. Um, so the model really does make a big difference. Um, and then we can use, because we've collected these data at different discharge stages, um, we can create sediment discharge rating curves um, for each river and for the different grain size bins. Um, and using monthly discharge data that's available from, from different agencies in Myanmar, especially for the Irrawaddy, there's, there's a decent amount of data um, for the Salween, there's much less. Um, but using using what we can, we can convert um, the monthly discharge to the monthly variation in suspended sediment. 
um, and in grain size, for example. So you can see obviously that most where the discharge is highest in the monsoon, that's where the sediment concentrations are obviously much higher and their coarser, more sand is being transported. And we can convert these also into then monthly sediment fluxes and monthly POC flux. Um, and the values, often the values that we that we have that I'm plotting here is from the, the four days that we've been there. Um, it seems like we hit the monsoon pretty spot on the times that we were there. Um, so that's why they're sort of much higher than the monthly average values because the, you know, the monthly averages are usually yeah, integrate some days where the, the flow is not as high as in the very peak of the monsoon. Um, and so from the monthly fluxes, then we can calculate the total annual flux as well. Um, and what we got for the Irrawaddy and the Salween, um, for the Irrawaddy, we got about 330 megatons per year. Um, of suspended sediment flux and where the Salween about 160 megatons per year. Um, and in terms of POC organic carbon, each one transports about a, a megaton of carbon per year. And to put this in the context of, of global rivers, in terms of SPM flux, um, the Irrawaddy displaces Irrawaddy in fifth place worldwide uh, in terms of flux and the Salween is in the seventh place. So they're really, you know, worlds, uh, Large, some of the world's largest rivers in terms of discharge of sediment. Um, and so um, to finish off, um, I think our, these new estimates um, for the Rwari and the Salween really confirm the, the dominant, dominance of, of Southeast Asian rivers. Um, and so the Millen, Millman and Farnsworth map, um, you know, is, is um, Definitely not wrong, um, but we do need much more data from, from this region. And there's still some huge uncertainties on a lot of these large rivers. Um, you know, some of these estimates in the past are, you know, they don't really have ADCP data. They, um, sometimes they've, they're estimated just from surface sediment samples. Um, and um, there's some large uncertainties um, on the fluxes of, of a lot of large rivers globally. So similar work has to be done in other places. Um, and I wanted to mention that you know this approach is quite easily applicable to other rivers if if you have similar ADCP and, and suspended sediment data. Um, so if you're doing similar work somewhere else, um, or if you're planning to to collect depth samples and ADCP data, and you're interested in applying a similar um, you know method or um, of modeling the data, I'm, I would be really happy to help. Um, so feel free to reach out, um, and you know. The, the, the most difficult part of all this really is, is collecting the, the suspended sediment samples at different depths. Um, but if you're doing that, then um, you know, everything else is uh, relatively easy. Um, and then I wanted to mention that um, um, these rivers, the Rawari and Salween, are still could be considered relatively pristine in terms of, of their sediment fluxes. Um, so this map shows the sort of the best that I could find. It's not very good quality, but um, the red triangles are different dams um, that have been constructed in, in the basins. And the green ones are dams that are um, under construction or in planning stages. Um, and so, so far the main stem of each one has not been dammed, dammed um, but there's a lot of dams being planned. Um, and so that's really going to, if they get built, it's going to impact the sediment fluxes a lot in each of these basins. Um, and then another anthrop anthropogenic pressure is uh, sand mining or dredging, um, especially in the Rawadi. And this is footage from uh, when we were there um, in 2018. You can see these ships, um, they're dredging barges dredging the um, sand and gravel from, from the river bottom. So you can see in several places on the, um, in the channel, these, these huge sort of uh, flotillas uh, of these ships. Um, and it's a big industry and you know, most of the sand gets exported um, out of Myanmar, um, but it's probably going to only increase in the future as well. Um, so I think our measurements here provide a pretty important baseline um, for sediment fluxes from these rivers um, before they really get impacted and to get a sort of 
um, I think it'll be very useful to have these numbers to get a sense of how these fluxes are changing uh, in the future. Um, so with that, I'm flashing up all the references that I mentioned throughout the talk. So you can pause here if you're interested in looking any of them up. Um, most of the work that I've been showing, um, our work has been published in this paper at the top uh, in GNGR Earth Surface. Um, and with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Uh, this is fantastic, Yotas. This is a great, great work. And particularly, you know, uh, uh, the method you are using is very uh, useful for future in those engaged river system. And also if we want to do a quick, you know, uh, more frequently measure of that kind of sediment also in quality carbon, I think that's, you provide a fantastic way. For us. Yeah, and something that I didn't, I actually forgot to mention is that once this work is done, you know, for your Wadi and Salween now, assuming these sediments, you know, don't change in terms of their composition, we have these curves now. And essentially, the only thing you really need to do is call, go and collect ADCP data. And you should be able to apply this model and, and get an estimate of sediment flux um, just from ADCP data at this point. Yeah, that, that's a great, uh, you know, you have that tool available, but also. On the, in the field work, you know, the logistically is very manageable. Uh, you don't need a big boat. And uh, so you can use a relatively small hookup the ADCP and very quickly do a couple cross session uh, measurement. And okay, uh, in the audience, if you have uh, any question, you can raise your hand or you can unmute yourself. Let's, let me check, let's, let me, you know, you can unmute yourself, you can go ahead to ask your questions or you can copy your question there. Also to the audience uh, on our YouTube channel, if you have any question, you can also type a text there or you can come here for the Zoom to directly uh, ask uh, you this. Okay, so let me see. Uh, anybody have a question? Okay, uh, before we take a question, you just let me ask you, did, have you uh, re- occupy some transition, do a couple couple survey to verify. Uh, most of the time you show a one-time survey across the channel. Did you do back and forth a couple of time to you know, uh, validate your survey? Yeah, for the discharge, I mean, usually, um, you know, we would try and do it at least, um, you know, at the very minimum, we'd go back and forth, but we would try to do at least four, maybe if we can, sometimes six transects. Um, to to verify the discharge and, and you know the to calculate an average um, cross section and most of the time there was really you know you pretty much you can do it once um, and the uncertainties are uh, quite low so we, you know the standard deviation on on replicates of it was just a couple percent usually so that's ADCP is really a wonderful instrument um, when it yeah. works well um, so yeah most of the time we did multiple ones it was much easier in the dry season when the channel is much um, you know, narrower and, and the flow is not as high, but during the wet season, some, in some places there's a lot of shipping also, you know, mm -hmm. big uh, ships going down the river, which you have to avoid. Um, and you have to go, you know, you try and go as slow as possible. When the flow is strong, you have to, you're really angled against the flow and it takes a long time to go from one end to the other. Um, okay. So a bit limited by that. Very nice. You, you show the POC estimate. Uh, is anybody in your group now working on the DOC or even the DIC part? Yeah, so we've collected samples for um, DIC. Um, we've measured, you know, we've done, so all of this, you know, focused on sediments um, for this talk, but we've collected yeah. a lot of dissolved samples. The nice thing about these filtration units is that you get a lot of very well filtered, you know, um, uh, water. Uh, and so we've measured DOC, um, We've measured alkalinity, um, and we're planning to measure DIC as well. So we'll get the, the you know ultimate goal of this whole project is yeah. to constrain the full carbon cycle, the organic and inorganic, for for these river basins, dissolved and particulate. Uh, so that's all, yeah, in progress. Okay, very nice. So I talked with you at other time about the carbon part. Yeah. Okay, now we have some question from audience. Uh, first, uh, Jim Best, then Courtney Harris. James, Jim. Yeah, yeah. Th thanks, Paul. I, th thanks, thanks to talk with you. Just, uh, I just had a couple of questions, actually. One was um, in, in your talk, you, you stated that the bed morphology of the of the river was more, I think you said, more complex than the Ganges 
or the uh, Amazon. So I'm just wondering, you know, uh, what that meant by that and also why. Um, and the second question, just on, on, on shear um, velocity, um, given the uh, beam spread with ADCPs and also blanking distance, what's the uncertainty in uh, deriving U star? Um, okay, great questions. So for, for the bed morphology, I mean, I'm, okay, so I'm really a geochemist. Um, so some of the things I say might not really um, necessarily be uh, very accurate in, uh, in the geomorphology, geomorphological sense. Um, but, you know, just looking at those, at those figures, um, it's really what we found often is that we couldn't find a stretch of the river that, you know, was just had a nice talweg in the middle and, you know, where the flow is happening in the middle and so on. And often you had to go, there were uh, sandbars, some of them submerged, some of them uh, subaerial that, that you have to go and the, the flow splits up here and there. So they're, you know, sort of a bit braided. Um, and so we really... Um, yeah, what we found is that essentially from uh, what I really meant by the, the more complex stuff is that sand, you know, um, or sediment concentrations were quite different depending where you were in the channel and, and the flow was quite different. So um, that's really what, what I meant by that. Um, sorry, what was the second part? Oh, the uncertainty of, of the shear velocity. Yeah. So there's yeah. been you know, I was re reading up about this one and trying to figure out the best way to do it. And um, it's a bit difficult to estimate the uncertainty. I think most of uncertainty comes from the sort of time averaging that you get from it. Um, I and mean, there's different methods of estimating it, but from people who use ADCP data, there's been some papers where they really compared sort of some different methods of doing that. And the law of the wall seems to hold up quite well. And, and you know, that's sort of used essentially just you take the average shear velocity, uh, or you take the average, sorry, flow velocity um, over depth, and um, you know you can calculate from that the shear velocity easily. Um, people, I've tried also fitting um, a power law um, to to the whole water column, and you know integrating over that, but it didn't really make much difference because you know the the flow velocity is quite. Um, constant throughout the depth and then just really decreases at the very bottom where we don't really get much data with ADCP anyways. I, I was sort of interested, you know, in, obviously in deep channels with beam spread, depending on the ADCP you're using, that the spatial volume that you sample at the bottom will yeah. be different to the top. Yeah, so I'm just wondering no, if you took any account for what the, the spatial change in volume is. I think the, you know, from what I understand, the ADCP software, you know, accounts for that as much as, as it can. Um, and these channels are relatively um, shallow, you know, they were like 10, 20 meters. So they're not like 60 meters, like the Amazon at least. Uh, so yeah, there's definitely beam spread and there's sort of, yeah, the deeper you go, the more uncertain the velocity goes, the, the, it integrates over a higher um, area. And that's definitely true. Um, but yeah, besides, you know, combining with some other measurements, there's nothing that you can really do about that, I think. Okay, many thanks. Okay, uh, continue. Um, hi, first, very nice talk. Um, I will admit I missed the first five minutes or so due to technical difficulties. So maybe this is um, something that was covered in the intro. But um, I was interested to know if you have looked at the ADCP backscatter strength and if you've tried correlating your suspended sediment concentrations to the backscatter, if that would be another way to kind of extrapolate the concentrations across the channel. Yeah. So if, yeah, I briefly mentioned this in the beginning that it's a it's a possibility um, because the ADCP, yeah, you know, it, it measures the backscatter, and we've looked into this. Um, and unfortunately for the Wadian Salween, it turns out that um, the sediments are uh, the sediment uh, grain size distributions are exactly such that um, it's pretty much um, impossible to do um, because of the big spread in the. There was a lot of fines in. Yeah, so there's the there's channel. a there's a lot of spread, yeah. and it's um, uh, I forget exactly what uh, there, there's also interference when you try to, uh, you know, you have to recalibrate the, um, um, what do you call it, the um, sonar equation, um, and in our case, the ADCP essentially, yeah, the the frequency of the ADCP wasn't um, really good for for the. Uh, 
most abundant grain sizes in, in these rivers. Um, so essentially what you need is multiple frequency instruments. Um, so we actually had a, like an acoustic list that we attached to the sampler as well that has a different frequency and that seems, seems to have worked better. So that's something that we're looking into um, if we can yeah, recalibrate and use more of the backscattered data, but mm -hmm. it's not very straightforward for these rivers. Um, our colleagues, uh, Steve Darby and, and Chris Hackney have done actually that in, in the Mekong um, where they managed to convert the backscatter directly into sediment concentration. And it worked there, I think, because it's much, there's less sand and it's much simpler uh, grain size distribution and sort of dominated by clay and silt. Um, but yeah, we've, we've looked into it, but it, it's not going to be easy. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, anybody else? And when we're reading the questions, you have another quick question. You showed the POC, the Eurowadi, about roughly 1 million tons <laughs> per year, and the Solway almost 1.0.9, uh, uh, almost the same. But uh, the Solway basically is much smaller in terms of water discharge and uh, sediment discharge. How come the Solway del deliver relatively much more POC, I mean, compared to the Eurowadi? I mean, if you look at this number. But the sediment to the solvent is much, much lower because of this. Yeah. yeah, essentially it comes down to this where the Salween is just more organic rich. Um, the sediment is more organic rich. So, you know, you can see for the same grain size pretty much. Uh -huh. the fine, so the median grain size of, of both of them is somewhere between 10 and, and, 20, and 30 microns, somewhere here. So you can see the Salween is, you know, almost double the organic carbon concentration at, at the median grain size compared to the Irrawaddy. And that's, that's the reason. Why it has so much more organic carbon, I don't really know. That's you know, something that we'll need to think about. Um, mm. I don't know if that's natural or if it's, it has to do with deforestation and erosion of, of soils or things like that. Um, but they're both, I think, if anything, I would expect the Salween to be less deforested than- Yeah, the yeah that's, you know, that's a little bit surprising. And you take a look at yeah. detailly. Uh, take a close look. And also, you know, uh, 2008, uh, Michael Bird, uh, his paper indicate yeah. uh, each river, the POC part with up to two, more than two million. And so yours estimate definitely is uh, only half compared much, to uh, this number. And I don't really know the, why we got such much, much lower sediment, uh, uh, organic carbon con uh, concentrations than they did. Um, I, I, I suspect that maybe it has to do something with sampling methodology yeah, yeah. or, you know, maybe they allowed the samples to decant or they had a much smaller sampler where you don't sample the sand mm -hmm. as if, because the better you sample the sand, the lower the actual, you know, organic carbon concentration. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any, anybody else? Any questions? If you have any questions, you can just go ahead to unmute yourself and speak. Um, Hi, Yatis. Um, I wanted to ask you if you've measured much of the geochemistry in the suspended sediments, particularly alumin and silicon. Yeah, so we've we've measured a lot, um, and that's all sort of you know papers in progress. Um, actually, we're, we're really drowning in data because you know you, there's a lot of sediment samples and um, you measure a lot of different elements in those, and so yeah, that's that's something that's coming up. Uh, in terms of the elemental budgets of of um, the sediments, um, you know the the provenance of where the sediments are coming from. So we've also done a lot of strontium and neodymium isotopes that are going to come out at some point in the future, and it'll be really um, I think interesting to see where um, where the sediments are coming from and what their composition is, and it should be really helpful also for the people working offshore and working at the you know sink side of things to. Uh, to help identify where those sediments are coming from, because there's some um, very useful, I think, differences between the Rawadi and the Salween that, that we're seeing, for example. Um, Do you, off the top of your head, know whether you're seeing any relationships with aluminium silica and the grain size distribution that you can calculate using this model? Yeah, so actually I didn't show, but you can, using the same model, you can make maps of, of aluminium silicon ratios or, um, you know, different elemental ratios that, that correlate well with grain size, right? Because the model gives you median grain size and then whatever chemistry correlates with that, like the organic carbon, you could, you could map out across the river channel. 
and I didn't show that, but yeah, we did that for aluminum silk and obviously it's correlated really well with, with the grain size. Yeah, that's expected. That's so, cool. Yeah, yeah it's, um, it's pretty cool to see. Yeah, yeah. very nice, Yotas. So uh, Yotas, if you feel comfortable and uh, um, maybe after modify, I hope you can share your uh, PowerPoint to this, to the, you know, all the students and this community because since, yeah, most of us already published or already in press. So uh, thank you. If you know any other question, uh, I want to welcome you again this uh, coming Friday. Uh, Sam Batley will talk about the Mississippi River. And I think it should be a, a very interesting talk. And so uh, um, other than that, um, thank you very much for today. And this talk is uh, also on the YouTube. If you go to our YouTube channel, if you want to rewatch, and it will be available. And so uh, thank you, thank you again. And I see you uh, this uh, Friday or next week. Okay? Yeah, cool.